research on scarcity and talk about what I've been talking about for the past six months, which is really how it relates to understanding the consumer response to the pandemic. And I'm talking about like the consumer response in the store. So, you know, I'm not an infectious disease specialist. This isn't political. It's really, you know, what's the psychology of scarcity that consumers are dealing with and how does that play out in terms of their purchase behavior, which hopefully will be interesting to you guys. Uh, but if it's not, I'm happy to talk about reality television. Um, I'm happy to talk about colleges. I've worked at a university or been at a university most of my life from undergrad to five years of grad school to eight years at Kellogg and then now three years going on four years at Vanderbilt. And I also dragged my mom to visit 30 colleges when I was in high school, um, 30. And I'm from San Diego and I, my dad had got his PhD at UCLA. So I'd been to UCLA and UCSD and I thought all colleges looked like those, which they don't like at all. Uh, the UCs have their own kind of flavor. And once I started to kind of peel back the onion and see how different different schools were, I, I couldn't get enough. So I own a lot of t-shirts from different colleges and I have a lot of experience on that. If you guys have any questions about that, I'm, I just wanna make this like maximally beneficial to you guys who are kind enough to forsake some of a beautiful Saturday afternoon hanging out with me. So it's, it's your time. This talk, me talking about my research, it, it'll take like 30 minutes maybe, and you can interrupt with questions if you want, or you can hold the questions, whatever works. Um, I, I wanna be sensitive to the fact that I know it's hard. It's hard to give up time on a Saturday. So what we're gonna talk about with my research is really we're gonna work together to try to solve this puzzle. And the puzzle is how we can make the most out of the many times every day when we feel like we don't have enough, which during the pandemic is like more often than ever before. And the reason this is a puzzle is that most people think about not having enough as being a really bad thing. But given we are all stuck dealing with it anyways, what I wanna challenge you guys to think about is are there ways in which we can actually leverage these feelings and turn them into something positive? Something that we can benefit from not only as individuals, but also as a group, right? That group might be your school, your family, this JEC, whatever it is for you. So think about that as I'm talking and hopefully we'll illuminate some of these points. So as Nina kindly mentioned, I've done research on the consumer response to scarcity and uncertainty for about 10 years. And these are some of the examples of things that I've studied. So we've got running out of money. There's a lot of good research on that. Scarcity marketing, that's two of those boxes that kind of, for me, the upper right and the bottom left. Uh, scarcity marketing is basically when you threaten consumers' access to products in different ways. You guys, I'm sure, have been on the receiving end of scarcity marketing promotions. So limited time to buy, limited number available, et cetera, maybe stockouts, as you see in the bottom left-hand corner. And what's really funny is I've been doing research in this space, like I said, for about a decade, and it used to be really hard to find pictures of consumers like staring at an empty shelf because here in the United States, at least, that's just not a reality that most consumers face most of the time. Like maybe you can't buy it, maybe you can't afford it, right? But usually if you can afford it, you can find a way to get it. And obviously this pandemic has really, has really challenged that uh, in a lot of product categories. So that's why I got invited to do a lot of media it was really around how consumers react when you threaten their access to everyday things. And then last but not least, we've got running out of time. So I've done a lot of research um, in all these different spaces. And then uh, the reality of today, right? The economic situation, which I'm sure is something you guys talk about as an economic club, there's a lot of, I mean, obviously there's a lot of joblessness. There's a lot of financial uncertainty, whether that means your job prospects coming out of high school or college or PhD programs, or that means, you know, your retirement accounts, whatever it is for you, bottom line right now, there's a ton of financial uncertainty, which can be really hard for consumers. In terms of scarcity marketing, really like it took on a whole new level with stores actually have to stores actually having to ration purchases, which was something that we had never seen during my lifetime, right? I'm 40, and we had never seen stores having to say, like, all right, only you only get the one thing of toilet paper, not two. And so how do consumers react when you actually threaten their access for every to everyday things, not just because you're trying to upsell them and it's a clever marketing ploy, but rather because there's a shortage that's driven by excess demand where the suppliers just couldn't keep up, right? In terms of the shelves, so these are pictures I took myself in the White Bridge Target. And I don't know how many of you guys got to like loiter in the White Bridge Target at the beginning of the pandemic. I hope you didn't because I'm sure it was covered in germs. But they actually took out a lot of the shelving because it was so depressing just to see all these empty shelves. 
Um, so you walked in and it looked kind of like an airplane hangar, which was, again, that was new to me. Um, I think that was new to a lot of consumers. So uh, real, I mean, this is real visceral scarcity uh, that's really threatening to people that have grown up with a lot of abundance. And I mean, abundance is relative. I'm just saying here in the United States versus other countries around the world, we expect to have 50,000 SKUs to choose from, 50,000 different products and brands and to choose from when we walk into the grocery store. You get on Amazon, right? And it's in the millions. We're not used to having that threatened. Like we really are in a mindset of abundance that many of us didn't even recognize because that's just been how it's been. We don't think about it actually as something that's not stable. And uh, the pandemic forced all of us to contend with that. In terms of running out of time, I do not know what it's like uh, as a high school student. I don't know if all this pandemic craziness also has you guys feeling like, wow, there aren't enough hours in the day. But I am a mother of twin five-year-olds who had them at home for a hundred days while I was trying to work. And let me tell you, running out of time, like the struggle is so, is so real. And um, I mean, I used plenty of good articles about how that's affecting people in the workforce. And, you know, it could be taking care of kids. It could be taking care of your parents. It could just be dealing with the stress of it all. That takes time. You need time for self-care. So the reality of today is we are all dealing with um, what I would consider to be scarcity and uncertainty at unprecedented levels. So what I want to do is look back on the research and I'll walk you guys through just a few of the research findings. There's actually what I would think. I mean, I like it, right? I've been doing this for 10 years. There's a lot of really interesting findings in this space. And I'm going to give you guys just a taste of some of the stuff that I think is most relevant. And then what I want to do is try to draw some positive takeaways. We've got enough negative takeaways right now. How can we leverage what we know from the academic literature about scarcity in order to move forward in this very confusing, very uncertain world we're living in these days. All right, so what got me interested in this? Uh, Nina mentioned I went to Duke and I went to Yale, but I, I graduated in bad years. So if anyone is a senior right now and is feeling like, God, this sucks, right? This is bad timing. I completely can empathize with those feelings. So I graduated from undergrad. So ramping up, I guess, try to like mentally like envision a world without much of an internet. Like there was some internet, but it wasn't, it wasn't, there was no Amazon, there's no smartphones, there's no Facebook, right? This is when I was in college, probably for the best, given the things that I did that were photographed, but that's fine. So this is the world I'm living in, right? And ramping up to my graduation, like a guy in my senior class started selling direct to consumer, low rise pajama pants, like made a website and started selling them online and was a millionaire before we graduated, right? So everybody, there were so many salient examples of people I knew, people my age, becoming overnight millionaires with these, you know, mom and pop tech startups that we all had very big hopes for our future that were very much wrecked when the tech bubble burst. So lots of people lost their job offers, lots of people lost money. And it went from being like, we really just felt like we were living and coming of age and in the best time ever to being like, ah, no. Uh, so that was me coming out of undergrad. So I did what you do uh, when you're coming out of undergrad and the economy falls apart. And I did go on a reality television show, uh, followed by going to graduate school, which allowed me to have a place to hide out for several years. Unfortunately, that con did not really work because I graduate. So I'm going to like not tell you guys the very, very long, boring story about how you get a job as a professor. I will give you guys the, the like two second overview which is that when you're trying to get a job as a professor, it's not like getting a normal job where it's like you send your resume, maybe there's a phone call, maybe there's another phone call with some other people, maybe you have an interview, and then it all wraps up in like six weeks or two months. Like in, as in academia, it's, a, it's at least a six month process, sometimes more like eight months. So it's a really long drawn out job market. So I sent in my stuff in July of 2000, send it to all these schools, right? Like a hundred of the top schools around the world. I send them my resume and all this stuff in July of 2008. And then your first round interviews are in August. And this universities, despite the fact that the recession was kind of happening, universities hadn't been hit that hard at that point. But between my first round of interviews and my second round of interviews, over like two thirds of the schools I had interviews with had hiring freezes where they couldn't hire at all. And so at the time, like the offers started going out, only five of the schools, I'd gone from like 30 schools down to five schools that I was in the pipeline with that would have been able to make me an offer, which was straight up terrifying because now I'm thinking like, I spent five years in graduate school, like I don't have a plan B, I'm gonna be a professor. Um, and there just weren't a lot of options. So that was really stressful as well. 
And, and all, all was well that ended well. I got a great job at Kellogg, but it was, this is what got me interested in studying scarcity. Cause actually both of these examples are what I would consider to be good examples of me experiencing what we call subjective scarcity. And if you're interested more in the distinction between subjective scarcity and objective scarcity, uh, you can check out my TED talk on YouTube. You can be like the person who watched it along with my mom. Uh, in it, I talk a lot more about the distinction between subjective and objective scarcity and like the ways they creep into our lives. But subjective scarcity is basically like you feel like you don't have enough or you might not have enough, even if like at that given moment, what you have is actually fine. So when I was coming out of grad school, like I could keep the lights on, I had my stipend, like my, my financially, everything was fine for me. And then I ended up getting a good job. So it stayed fine. But in that moment, when I was just seeing all these schools go on hiring freezes, I had this subjective sense that there wasn't enough that was very powerful and you know terrifying. So those two were my forays into uh, subjective scarcity. As Nina mentioned, my foray into objective scarcity. Objective scarcity is when you like actually don't have what you need, right? So like if your phone is out of battery, that's objective scarcity. If you're me, that's me in the little like yellow tube top uh, on Survivor, that's objective scarcity. So I don't know, Survivor's been around a long time. I'm assuming you guys have heard of it, if you know, maybe seen an episode or two. But um, basically like it's an it's a experiment in scarcity that unfolds on national television, right? So there's never enough water, there's never enough food, no one's getting enough sleep, and then the biggest scarcity threat of all is only one person is going to be the winner. So every few days, someone's kicked out of the tribe by these people they thought were their friends in front of millions of viewers, which I was like, yes, that sounds fun. In retrospect, like an odd choice, but you know, it is what it is. So uh, what was interesting to me from Survivor, which inspired some of the research I'll talk about, is actually that you think about competition and um, and survival, right? Really as being things that make us hostile or aggressive. And that was not my experience at all in the game of Survivor. Now, if you've seen any of the episodes, it actually, they do a good job of editing out the fact that most of the time people are just being like over the top nice to each other. Cause I think that's pretty boring television. But when you're there, it's actually like, people are very kind and very supportive. And that got me interested because that was counterintuitive to me. I expected it to be really like cutthroat and, and that was very much not the case. So and I'll walk you through how we actually took that notion that maybe scarcity and deprivation can lead to this empathy and community building almost behavior. Uh, we tested that in the lab with Northwestern undergrads. So I will circle back and talk about that. That's my first bullet point I got to when I talk about the research. So anyways, now cut to now, right? I've been at Northwestern, I'm now at Vanderbilt. I'm pointing to a screen that you guys can't see, it's right there. And I'm studying how these feelings of not having enough affect everyday decision-making. I'd like to say I study uh, what happens when everyday people don't have access to everyday things. Though sometimes I get pushback because I actually usually study undergrads at Vanderbilt and I've had people tell me they're not everyday people. So I leave that to you to decide. I also do a lot with online panelists. Now, when I, got to the, when I got to Northwestern and I'm like, okay, I got this research idea. I was on Survivor, crappy job market. I want to study scarcity. Like when you're, if you start a doctoral program, like you have to look and see, okay, well, what have people already done? And at the time, this was all there was. So actually though, if you're interested, if you're interested in economics or business, this book is killer. This is one of the best marketing books ever. Um, I'm going to go out and make that claim. And there's not that many... I shouldn't be throwing my field under the bus, but there's not that many good marketing books. Take my word for it. This one's amazing. And he has another one called Presuasion that's actually really good as well. So this guy's Robert Cialdini. He is a psychologist and he like never set out to write a groundbreaking marketing book, but he did. And in it, he talks about these principles of persuasion. So if you want to get people to do what you want them to do, what are the different levers you can pull? And go figure it was a bestseller because that sounds like that sounds pretty good to me. And his second principle of persuasion was scarcity, which is that it sort of corresponds to this notion in economics, since I consider you guys all to be economists, that scarcity increases value, which draws from the commodity theory literature. And the example that I always like to give is like gasoline, right? So as gasoline becomes harder to get, the price goes up at the pump. Like when the price goes up, what does that mean? We're willing to compete harder to get access to that resource. We're willing to give more of our money to get our share of the gasoline that's not as available, right? Classic supply and demand. So he leverages that when he talks about his principles of persuasion and basically says, 
if you want people to do something, right, make it a limited opportunity, etc. And that, of course, makes sense and is logical, but that wasn't what I was interested in. I was really thinking about my own, like, coming out in a bummer job market, having been on Survivor, which was weird, my own experiences of scarcity and how they affect, right, the everyday consumer in the store who's looking at her phone. She's got, she's going to be late to a meeting, so there's scarcity of time. Her phone, this is like me constantly, the battery is dying, so there's objective scarcity that she's got to, like, find a way to charge it. Then she passes a magazine that's got articles about macro level scarcity. There's not enough water in the world. God forbid she opens up some sort of social media app and she starts to feel like garbage about what she has because all her friends are taking these amazing vacations to South Carolina, even the, during the pandemic. I don't really know how. It's, you know, it's tough. And then when coronavirus hits, it's like, you want toilet paper? No toilet paper. You want Purell? I don't think so. How about a mask? Maybe not. You want to test? Sometimes no. Are you going to die? It's possible, right? So these are really messed up times. And I think as a human, like with feelings, who cares about other humans, it, this is awful, right? As a consumer behavior researcher, I think it's really interesting to take a step back and actually watch what people are doing, what people are buying, what people are not buying during these times and try to use those observations to get a better understanding of how these like very real, very visceral forms of scarcity impact our psychology and our consumer decision making. So to that end, I actually, we just finished on Monday. It was so much work. We, me and this other professor, this woman named Angela Lee, who's at Kellogg, we co-edited a special issue for one of our journals on the consumer response to the pandemic. And we received 138 submissions in three months, which is actually like academics do everything super slow. So for 138 teams of researchers to write 138 papers in three months is loco, like insane speed for them. And unfortunately that meant I had to then read them all and it was a lot, but I learned a lot about the consumer response to the pandemic and reading their nearly 140 papers. And it's, I mean, it's, there's super interesting stuff like the influence of fake news and all the reminders about COVID in the media you know, the way it affects spending behavior. And I'll talk about lots of my findings relate to it, but then I can also circle back more to what they find in the journal. The way that uncertainty has led to preference polarization, right? Like it really heightens our tendency to kind of latch on to certain people and just want to believe something so bad that the more they say, the more we believe them. It's really, I mean, it's, it's really interesting stuff. I'll actually, I'll send it along to you, Nina, when the special issue is out, if in case you guys are interested. So we have 20 papers that are getting published and they're about, like I said, diverse topics. We've got seven in there that are about what you think they would be about, which is like getting people to buy masks, getting people to wear a mask, getting people to use, you know, wash their hands. So driving these um, compliance behaviors, we call them. So, but that's only seven out of 20. The other 13 are about things like how do you turn down social invitations that you're not comfortable with? What do people think about you when you turn down social invitations that you're not comfortable with, et cetera? So, um, you know, how, how is being a first week, there was a great paper among the set of 20 that looks at how being a, um, an essential worker affected consumer psychology differently than not being designated as an essential worker. And what they found early in the pandemic is people ex who were designated as essential workers like a lot of people were jealous because that meant they got to work and get money, but actually they experienced way heightened levels of stress and anxiety because they were going into the workplace at a time when everyone was being told it was dangerous. So uh, that then, that sense of anxiety and that sense of alienation really from other people then carried over to affect um, the products they were interested in, the brands they were interested in, et cetera. So like I said, I'm like, I could talk about this forever, but I'll try to keep it semi-concise. I already told you guys I study undergrads, so we're good on this slide. Uh, and I threaten their access to everyday things. So this is something that's like a little plug for my field, if you guys are considering like what to be when you grow up. So I get to come up with whatever ideas I want, and then I get to run experiments on human people and like see what happens. And that's a pretty kick-ass job, right? It's pretty great. Um, if, I mean, if you're in psychology, you can do it too. Um, there's other disciplines. I'm not, marketing is not the only one, but I will say if you go into marketing, like job in the business school pays more than being a psychologist. So I, I advocate it for that reason. You want to get the degree in psychology, that's fine. Come on over to the dark side when it comes to getting a job. Come to a business school. They pay you more money and you get to teach fun classes like marketing, um, which, which I've always enjoyed. So this is an example of what I do. In, so I, picture yourself as an undergrad. Not hard to picture because you guys are about the same age. I bring in undergraduates into the lab. I then randomly assign them to you know, different conditions based on whatever I'm testing. So let's say in an ex this experiment, I wanna test how just bringing thoughts of scarcity to mind affects people's subsequent unrelated behavior. 
So in order to do this, we gave people this listing task where in the control condition, we had them list three things you can do with common everyday resources. So sugar, water, gasoline, et cetera. And for sugar, people write like, sweeten my tea, sweeten my coffee, bake a cake. In the scarcity condition, so this is, that's half the people. The other half the people, we assign them to the scarcity condition, very similar task, but instead of having them list three things you can do with those resources, we have them list three things you cannot do without those resources. So people write the same things. Again, sweeten my tea, sweeten my coffee, bake a cake. But for half of them, we've got them thinking about having adequate resources to do those things. And for the other half, we've got them thinking about not having enough. And it's amazing. You think that that's really minor, but that actually does carry over to drive a lot of different behaviors, just kind of getting scarcity on their mind. If you're interested in how this, there's a whole literature on what's called priming in psychology that studies how your exposure to these different types of, like here this would be exposure to a scarcity cue, how that then carries over to affect your subsequent unrelated behavior. A good place to start learning more about that is Malcolm Gladwell's book, Blink, actually talks about that in detail, if that's of interest to you. Um, it's kind of a dusty book at this point, but it makes pretty good points about social psychology and how priming affects behavior. Now, one thing we found across a bunch of papers, you can see there's like little fonts down in the bottom right hand corner. Um, those are all papers that I co-authored. We basically found that scarcity activates what we call a competitive orientation, which we took from the literature, academic literature is like boring and has these nerdy terms, but it's competitive nature, competitive orientation is essentially your tendency to assess your own resources or capabilities versus others as opposed to you know, not thinking like that or just comparing yourself to yourself. So this is really looking outward for reference points about what you have. And if you're interested, I mean, I, like reading academic papers is like I said, they're boring. It's not for the faint of heart, but if you're interested um, on the bottom of the slide and I can share my slides with Nina or you guys can just go to my website, which is profgoldsmith.com, which I bought because it was way cheaper than kellygoldsmith.com. So you can go to profgoldsmith.com and all my papers are linked there and you can have them for free if that's of any interest to you. Actually, I take it back. Do go read them and then get your PhD in marketing and then come join me in this field because I'm telling you, it's not a bad gig. I like my job. Um, so we, that was like the essential, what they call in psychology, like the mechanism that we find that explains these effects. Because scarcity activates a competitive orientation, it then down the chain of events produces these outcomes, right? The first one uh, is that scarcity often increases selfish behavior. So we published this in 2015 and it is still my most cited paper. And it is the reason I get to go on like Fox News and USA Today and talk about toilet paper all the time. Because, you know, weird, I mean, it sort of seems like, duh, but nobody else had published it before we did. So, and then it ended up being really relevant during the pandemic. So one is true, but it's kind of a bummer. The second bullet point, it gets a little bit rosier. So the same mechanism, the fact that you feel competitive, it can actually increase generosity, similar to what I experienced on Survivor, albeit for self-interested reasons. So this is your, like, if we put it in a good light, it's your win-win scenario. Uh, if you want to put it in a, a more pejorative light, it's like giving to get, right? Like, so operating based on a norm of reciprocity. So you're not doing it because you're an altruist, you're doing it because you're an egoist, as the psych, psych literature would say. Um, but I actually see this as a positive outcome because I do feel like when the world is running out of stuff, I don't care if you give me your extra toilet paper because you think I'm going to help you down the road. That's, I still need toilet paper, right? So I think promoting the sharing behavior in times, these tough times of scarcity, I don't mind whatever psychological mechanism explains it. If you're doing it because you think it helps you, I'm fine with that. Last one, and I think this is the most positive one, is that scarcity can increase the desire for self-improvement. And self-improvement, I think I have the nerdy academic definition on a subsequent slide, but it's really this tendency to want to get better on important self-relevant dimensions. And that varies idiosyncratically across individuals. So what is like an er important area of self-improvement for you might be different for me. But when you feel like the world is running out of stuff, it does activate this desire to kind of like bring forth your best self. And I see that even though it's explained by the same mechanism, the reason you want to do that is because basically like if the world is running out of stuff, the person who's first in line is going to get all the goodies. And how do you get first in line is by being your most competitively fit self. So, you know, again, stronger, smarter, faster, whatever that may be. Uh, but still, I see this as a positive result. 
And we, I'll show you some data. This is, does actually talk on uh, talk about lipstick. It's they find lipstick sales go up during recessions for this reason, um, in part because women like want to attract partners, but also because they want to be you know noticed at their jobs, etc. They're bringing their best selves to the table in an effort to combat the scarcity related stress. So again, I don't see one kind of a bummer. Two and three, I actually think not so bad. All right. So these were some of the effects we observed in the lab. Somehow I still have 12 slides left and I feel like I promised you guys this would be half an hour. So I'm not gonna talk any faster because I can't do that to you. You look like nice people, um, but I will, I may skip a few slides. So what we observed in the lab, this is from that finding one that scarcity can increase selfish behavior. The first one we did um, as budding economists. So we brought undergraduates into the lab we randomly assigned them to the scarcity condition or the control condition. And then we had them play classic economic games. So like the dictator game, for example, if you haven't run across it, first of all, if you're gonna be an economist, consider being a behavioral economist. Again, cause you can get a job teaching in a business school, which is great, but also behavioral economists get to run these types of experiments. So like Daniel Kahneman, Nobel prize winner, uh, is considered a behavioral economist. Dan Ariely, about 50 jillion books, gets paid at least 50 grand to give a talk. Um, behavioral economist. So it's it's a good it's a good gig, and you still get to leverage your interest in economics, but you also get to do experiments on people. So uh, this dictator game DV is basically you tell this lovely undergrad in the lab, like, look, you're paired with somebody else in the lab. You don't you're not going to know who it is. They're not going to know who you are. I'm giving you ten dollars. I want you to divide it between yourself and this other person. It's totally anonymous. What's your decision? That's the dictator game because the person, the participant, is the dictator who makes the decision. And what we found uh, is that those people who are exposed to those scarcity cues, so list three things you cannot do without sugar, they kept more of the money for themselves, they gave less to other people. Um, and another experiment, we did uh, charitable giving. So these undergraduates come in, usually they get $5, we gave them $6, we say, look at you, you get an extra dollar. If you wanna donate to UNICEF, uh, click this box. If you don't wanna donate it, just take the money and walk out. And what we found is those who are exposed to scarcity cues were actually more likely to just take the money and walk out and not give the money to charity. And we actually did see um, also increased cheating behavior. So if you participate in a lab experiment as an undergraduate and you get a um, task that like asks you to grade your own work, this is probably an experiment about cheating. Uh, Dan Ariely, who I already mentioned, that's a DV that or a dependent variable that he uses all the time. He's like, they're not, it's not like hardcore cheating, but it's like, you're kind of rounding up your answers for a little extra cash. And we, we lifted that from his playbook and we, and we had essentially gave people these anagrams they had to unscramble and they got to self-report how many they got right. But of course, like we can see their work and we actually know how many they got right. So we're really just interested in the cheating. We don't mind paying them a little extra if they cheat, which they did. So people in the scarcity condition were significantly more likely to over-report their correct answers and cheat a little bit for more money. So those are all the bummer results. You, and again, like I said, I've been talking like a lot about toilet paper uh, in the past six months. I think that does explain a, some of the behavior we've seen in store with the hoarding. It doesn't, it, to me, this behavior, which has gotten a lot, it's gotten a bad rap. A lot of people wanna say it's irrational. A lot of people wanna say consumers are stupid. A lot of people wanna point out, what are you gonna do with toilet paper if the world comes to an end? Um, that's like a substitutable good. But I actually think, what I like to say is, um, I think it's important to be non-judgmental when we observe these behaviors, because if you think back to the early days of the pandemic, and honestly, to a certain extent, even now, nobody knows how long it's gonna last. And if you don't know how long it's gonna last, getting a ton of stuff is an adaptive strategy to make sure you're okay, right? And if you don't know when there's gonna be toilet paper in store again, buying all the toilet paper is kind of an adaptive strategy to make sure you're okay. So I, I like to point out whenever people ask me about this, in the lab, we do see this like increased cheating. We do see increased selfish behavior, but we don't actually ever see people like taking somebody else down just for fun. They're usually only doing it to protect themselves because they feel like their resources are scarce or could be scarce. So I don't think scarcity makes you malicious or a jerk or like selfish in the negative sense. I actually think it makes you selfish in the positive sense that you're just trying to protect yourself and your family, which is how human beings have survived on this planet for as long as we have. So I think it's hard to, you know, get too mad about that, but that's just me. All right, so then we showed that and then the journal gave pushback and was like, okay, if it's true that scarcity activates this competitive orientation, you know, you should be able to flip it and show that scarcity can also increase generosity because 
there's times when you advance your own case by helping other people, right? This giving to get works sometimes. So we leveraged that suggestion and we, uh, again, did the scarcity task versus the control task. So everybody did one of those two things first. They then move on to an unrelated task that was designed to simulate a scenario that undergraduates commonly face. So here we've got our undergraduate. He's like studying really hard for this test. It's not going great. He has a friend that he knows took the test in the past and did really well. Ask the friend for some help. The friend gives him the help. He does really well on the test. So then we ask all the undergraduates, all right, do you want to give the friend a gift to say thank you for helping? And it didn't sound as weird as an artificial as I'm making it sound on setup. It sounded believable. So, and we had different measures for generosity. So like how much would you spend on the gift? What's your likelihood of giving the gift, et cetera. And what we found, and this was an important insight, was that those in the scarcity condition were actually, oh, sorry, am I missing something so critical? That's, that's just one part of it. So scarcity or control, do you want to give the gift? That's all we say. That's half. The other half of the people, scarcity or control, they read the same scenario, but we tell them, if you help the friend now, they might be much more likely to help you again in the future if you need it. So we emphasize that there's like a benefit to you in helping your friend and being generous. And what we saw actually was that the people in the scarcity condition were very strategic. So if there was no benefit to them, they were more selfish, they were more likely to keep the money, spend less on the gift, et cetera. However, if we emphasize that in the future, you can benefit, like you will benefit because you helped this person, they were actually the most generous out of everybody, which was this really breakthrough finding because it's this notion that scarcity doesn't have to be this blunt instrument that makes us hostile or aggressive, but it's, it's, it just makes us keenly aware of returns on investment, which allows us to then make strategic decisions with our, with our own best interest in mind. And I think if you take that perspective that people under scarcity aren't being mean or irrational, they're being strategic and they're protecting themselves. I, again, like I said, I think it's harder to get mad at other consumers when they take the less thing of toilet paper, uh, but that may just be me. All right. So last but not least, this is going to be our silver lining talking about the desire for self improvement. Um, the prior, the prior examples I'm talking about with scarcity, we're always dealing with, you know, you've got scarcity on your mind or you're down and then you're making allocation decisions where either like you get like in the dictator game, if you get more, the other guy gets less. If the other guy gets more, you get less. So we wanted to run some experiments where we actually took the other guy out of the picture. So just you, you, yourself, and you. And we're seeing how scarcity affects your consumer behavior. And we were interested in this notion, like does scarcity make you want to be your best self? Drawing from the notion that if the world is running out of stuff, like your only fighting chance of survival is by being competitively fit, smarter, stronger, faster, et cetera. So could we actually leverage that in a consumer sense if we activated scarcity, would people actually be more interested in these products that are framed around self-improvement? And we did see, we have seen, I should say, substantial evidence of this. So on the left, this was an experiment we ran. We put scarcity, people in the scarcity condition or the control condition. We looked at their interest in downloading this app that says build a healthier lifestyle. It's a real app. And people in the scarcity condition were significantly more interested in downloading the app. The second one, this one's a little, it's a little goofy, but you got to do what you got to do when you're running studies on undergrads. This is back when we ran studies in person too. So is the post-it note one. So we had to get a product that was definitively associated with self-improvement that could be paired with other products that were very similar, but not associated with self-improvement. And so we actually turned to vitamin water because vitamin water has this one vitamin water called essential. And in their actual like ad copy where they talk about it, it basically tells you it's gonna make you smarter. So that's a self-improvement related benefit. And then what we did was we, again, our undergrads are in the scarcity condition or the control condition. We have them look at all these vitamin waters. Only one is associated with self-improvement. And we look at the likelihood of them choosing the self-improvement related product out of the set. And in line with our predictions, people in the scarcity condition were significantly more likely to choose the self-improvement related product. The last study is my fave, but since we're sort of running out of time, I'll do it a little bit. I'll gloss over it, but just know that it's super good. So I like study, I feel like if you study something really boring and you get a result, like it's easy to get action on stuff where consumers really give a crap. Post-it notes, let me tell you, no one has ever cared about post-it notes. I mean, if you don't have them and you need them, that's pretty much the only time you care. Like nobody's got a burning desire for post-it notes. So we, we leaned into the boringness of post-it notes. And um, what we did, again, we've got people in the scarcity condition or the control condition. And this is like a real study that was incentive compatible using the Becker, DeGroote, and Marshak um, press solicitation 
See that? See, if you become an economist, you get to learn like really cool things like that. So that's the task we gave them, which is, like I said, incentive compatible. We looked at their willingness to pay for post-it notes and we took either like the generic post-it notes with normal post-it note ad copy versus post-it notes where we said, post-it notes, the secret weapon for those looking to improve themselves. And lo and behold, people in the scarcity condition were willing to pay significantly more money for the boring ass post-it notes when they were associated with a self-improvement related benefit versus the control condition. So I thought that was exciting. Um, like I said, I get excited about boring products, but also when you see people who are in the scarcity condition willing to part with their money, I think that says a lot because these are people that are willing to like cheat a little for small amounts of money. So I think it really shows you where their values are and that suggests that their values are in line with self-improvement, which I think, again, when you think about it that way, it's easier to be a little less judgmental. Um, in the real world, have we seen an uptick in self-improvement related product sales during the pandemic? I think it's a little early days to tell, but there's some indication that yes. So Pelotons, like you can't even get a Peloton, they're flying off the shelves. And of course, part of that is we're all stuck at home and people are looking to get some exercise, but Pelotons are super expensive. Right? I didn't know that until the pandemic, how expensive they are. And the fact that like they cannot even keep a $4,000 exercise bike in stock is saying a lot. Again, people are putting their money where their interest is. And apparently their interest is in being healthy. Similarly, vitamins like selling like crazy, skincare selling like crazy. Um, you can say the vitamins help keep you healthy and protect you from the pandemic. I'm not quite sure about skincare, right? So we'll see if it gets a, a little bit more distal with respect to the self-improvement related benefits. So what I hope I convince you guys of today, um, we frequently feel like we don't have enough. That is more true right now during a pandemic than it has ever been in my lifetime and probably yours as well, I'm assuming. Um, and no way, and honestly though, I gave the same talk when people had plenty. I gave the same talk when we had the longest you know, bull market of all time. Just as consumers, we frequently feel like we don't have enough. And I'm not one of those people who walks around trying to turn off those feelings. Um, I think we just have to accept it that it is what it is. That we live in a world that makes us feel like we don't have enough sometimes. So how do we leverage those feelings and try to make the most of them? If you're trying to sell stuff to people or persuade stuff to persuade people to do things for you uh, when their resources are scarce, it is hard. So for example, I give away, like I let real clients here in Nashville work with my students as, on projects and it's free for them. And they get smart and talented MBAs to work with them for free. During the pandemic, it's even been hard to give it away because people are so protective of their time that they don't want to commit. They don't want to overcommit right now. So how do you navigate the fact that people are going to be really protective of their time and their money during a pandemic? I think you really need to highlight what's in it for them. Like the CDC, and this was early in the pandemic, the CDC ad, uh, ad CDC promotion that starts with protect yourself and then your community, right? Like I think really emphasizing that you stand to benefit is important for different audiences and that this is a win-win, right? Taking care of ourselves. Um, we benefit everybody if we take care of ourselves and vice versa, if we take care of our neighbors, we also benefit. All right, last but not least, if you're a brand, I think you need to think about, and this is, I'm assuming none of you guys are brands yet, but you know, give you two to three years, I'm sure you will be. Um, you need to think about how you can emphasize that you're gonna be a partner with people in self-improvement, which is not traditionally how brands think about positioning themselves. So I think it's important to challenge companies to think that way. And that's it, you guys. I'm done, I talked so fast. Um, Nina can, can feel free to pose whatever questions have come up in the chat. Awesome, um, we've got a few queued up. So my first question is, um, you know, you made a number of accurate predictions about consumer behavior uh, during the pandemic, what has surprised you or has anything surprised you? Oh my God. Well, I get a question a lot. I got a question a lot in the beginning about like, how long are the effects, like how long lasting will the effects of the pandemic be? And I don't know about you guys when this started, but like, I really thought this, I, you can feel free to think I'm an idiot. I really thought it was going to last two weeks. Like I really did not see, like they told me I couldn't teach in the classroom. I teach a seven week course. And they said, in week one, they said, you're not in the classroom anymore. I thought, well, we'll be back by the middle of the month. Like at four weeks, we'll definitely be back in the classroom. So I wasn't like preparing to teach remotely for seven weeks and then not go into my office for six more months, right? So in the beginning, I, I mean, so that, that's one thing that surprised me. But um, in the beginning, what I would always say to the press was like, look, if this just lasts a month or so and, and we get past it, it's, it's not really going to kick a dent in the side of consumer psychology 
because people are resilient and people want to forget this and you know this has all been terrible and we're going to want to like put it in the past uh i think we have now crossed over the tipping point into this is going to kick a dent in the side of consumer psychology i you know for generations i think we just have never had to process this much uncertainty and i think it changes the way you think about risk and it changes the way you think about your future and it changes the way you think about all kinds of things from financial investments to career choices um, and to where you want to live how close you want to be to family i mean it's it really has you know do you want like as a mom you know do you want to work anymore like there's been so many changes that have happened and i don't i think it's it's going to be it's going to define not just a generation i think it's going to define all of us um having lived through it because again this this level of uncertainty for this long it, it's like we're not really built to process this type of uncertainty like we need a little bit more structure and uh, predictability and um yeah i think it just changes your outlook on the world when you have to wake up every morning not knowing quite like what's going to be in your newsfeed and what that's going to mean and if you can go into work or if your job's still there you know i think that's been really surprising to me i think it's just that the duration of the virus i think it's it's really going to have a more substantial change on on everything that i would have expected um our next question is um do you think the pandemic has affected or changed the workplace behavior while working remotely yes 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 i i mean yes yes and more yes there's i mean i'm not an organizational behavior person but they also do experiments on humans and it's also like a super fun field and you get to teach in a business school so if i haven't sold you on marketing yet do consider that one and i'm sure they're all doing good research right now because just silly stuff like communicating over zoom I think is qualitatively different than being face to face for a variety of reasons. And I think it, it's also tough for, I mean, you don't realize how much of your day is made easier because of social norms that are set by your school or your workplace. Like, you know how to behave because this is how people behave because we're all social animals and we get there and we understand the social norms and it kind of gives us some guideposts for how to live our life. And this pandemic, nobody had it, no, nobody had a guideposts, right? Like, nobody knew how to use zoom and then what the norms and etiquette over zoom are still developing right and so i think that um yeah i think that that's tough and i think that because we've been at this i mean so many people are never i mean like my girlfriend is she's high up at dollar general i was just talking to her today and she was saying they've told her that she's going to be remote forever because these companies start learning that so basically dollar general here in Nashville, their corporate headquarters here, they leased out two huge, super expensive buildings. And they realized, you know what, if some of our execs can work from home, we can save a ton of money and overhead on rent. And that and Dollar General is not the first company to think of that. You know, my people who work at Twitter, all kinds of people are being told they might be working at home forever. And that, I mean, that changes your life decisions because some people, I mean, God knows me during various life phases, if you move to a new city, like I did when I moved to Chicago, my friends all came from work because that was, I didn't know anybody there. And if people are not afforded that possibility to really get socialized through their jobs, you got to find another way to do it. And so that might really change, like, I mean, maybe, maybe it's for the best, right? Maybe people are going to start to socialize and kind of get their social needs met more by family or maybe more by people that share interests outside of work. You know, I think we will compensate, but I think it's, we don't have a roadmap for how to compensate. Like I think right now a lot of people are lonely and struggling. It's depleting, right? There's another good literature on depletion by Roy Baumeister. Um, also Kathleen Bowes, really, really interesting experiments that kind of shows when you're thrown into a situation where, there, where you don't know the rules, it's, it's exhausting because you spend a lot of your day just looking to people around you trying to figure out how to behave. And I think until those rules are more obvious, you know, we're just going to be pretty exhausted all the time. So I hope you guys find ways to like compensate, do some self care, be nice to your parents. I don't know, whatever, go for a run. If you're into that, I'm so not into that. I can't even believe I just suggested that maybe cook. Um, yeah, whatever the cool kids do, do that thing. Um, our next question is about college. Um, so you said that you visited 30 colleges. Um, how many did you get into? I, I applied early to Duke. So I, I visited 30 colleges and I got, I had a little bit of a runway. I don't know when you guys probably start looking at colleges when you're like seven and a half, but I didn't look until I was, um, I didn't really look until I was a junior. 
And then my first college trip was this, we did the East Coast schools. We saw like 13 schools in the Northeast. And that was when I, I, I mean, I'm sure I'd been to the Northeast, but I just, I'd never like been on Harvard's campus or whatever. And it was so different than what I'd grown up with in the UC system that I was like, I oh, know I must be, I need to do some more data collection around this. So then, you know, I visited all the Northeast schools and, you know, the Mid-Atlantic and the Midwest and then Northern California, which is different than Southern California and the South. And pretty quickly, I, I, I don't want to get too in the weeds on this because it's pretty like boring autobiographical details. But since you asked, I'm going to tell you, um, my high school or my school I went to, it was uh, pre-K through 12. And I was there the whole time. I had a great experience, like class president, all that stuff. But I was like ready for some new faces because I had been at the same school since I was like four and a half years old. So uh, one thing that was attractive about Duke is at the time I applied, no one in the history of my school had ever applied there. So I applied there and I got a whole lot of new faces. And I liked the South because it was warmer and it had a lot of the benefit. To me, it had a lot of benefits of the Northeast like Ivy's, but it wasn't as cold. It wasn't as, um, it wasn't as much of a culture shock as it would have been um, coming, like if I had gone to a Ivy League school coming from San Diego, I mean, it, it would have been a big adjustment. I had, later on did go to an Ivy League school, right? And even then it was a pretty big adjustment, it's different. Um, but I will say like one thing that's nice about going to grad school or even like you can do certificate programs like these universities have lots of different options. It's a neat way to live in different parts of the country and like try those things on for size. Um, that's kind of, I mean, there's a cost of tuition obviously, but it's not like you're committing to having a job there and getting an apartment there forever and all that drama. So I, I'm glad I lived in all the different places that I did. Um, and I'm glad that I ended up in Nashville because clearly I ended up in the best place. All right, um, our next question is um, also related to college. Um, what are some of the like non-traditional undergrad majors that you think are relevant or helpful for studying business and working in business? You guys, none. Okay, so this is my like soapbox on this. A lot of universities, including Duke, they do not let you do anything that looks like undergraduate business, which is fucking stupid. Um, I don't understand why these, I mean, I think they think it makes, undergrad looks fancier if you're not allowed to take classes that make any sense. I think we are robbing these good, smart undergrads of studying stuff that's actually interesting. And um, so like as evidenced by my profanity, like I am really confused by this. And Vandy has come around a little. So now they like, they used to have an undergraduate minor that was called something opaque, but it was secretly an undergraduate business minor. But now they've like decided they're comfortable actually calling it an undergraduate business minor. And if Vanderbilt is doing that, I have to believe that other schools are gonna move in that direction too. So, I mean, I don't know. I just, I can only speak for myself. I wish I could have taken like actual business classes in undergrad. The best that they offered at Duke was economics and economics is fine. Yes, economics can get, opens a lot of doors, right? If you wanna be a consultant, if you wanna go into business, if you wanna go into banking, basically if you wanna make it, if you wanna take a job where you make a lot of money an undergrad economics degree is a good bet. Um, but that said, it doesn't light up everybody. You could get an econ minor and then major in business. And I mean, I don't think higher companies would judge you for that. So, and also though, I will say, because um, I think these schools are getting a little bit aware that there's demand. I'm not the only human that thinks this is a good idea. So a lot of schools, including Kellogg and Vanderbilt, both offer um, one-year degree programs that you can take out of undergrad, where you could get like a master's in management. And I, and some schools, you guys got to do some digging when you get there. So some schools at Yale, they had this, it was called the Silver Scholars, but they didn't publicize it. But while you're an undergrad, you can actually take classes in the business school and then you graduate in five years, but you get an MBA and an undergrad degree, which is wildly cost effective. And it was not competitive to get into that program because they weren't publicizing it. So like people who wanted it could just walk into it. So when you're thinking about schools, just suss out these options. Like don't be afraid to dig through the materials because sometimes there's more there than you think. And I can't tell you like exactly what they would call it because different schools have bizarre names for these things. Cause I think sometimes they want to hide the fact that they actually offer undergraduate business in different ways. Um, but that's dumb. And I think the world is changing. And so hopefully if you are interested in undergraduate business that will be available to you. Cause studying business is ridiculously interesting. Like I wish I could have done it sooner. Okay, but one more thing. So like, let's say your school doesn't have it. Cause there's, I mean, like I probably, I still chose to go to Duke and they didn't really have anything that met my needs in that, like my undergraduate degrees in sociology, which was easy, which has advantages, but useless in terms of like a career. Um, 
but I, I don't regret it. But I will say, like, let's say your school has nothing for you. You can, with, you know, this thing called the internet, you can educate yourself just by reading books, et cetera, et cetera, following people that are kind of in the public intellectual sphere. You can learn a ton on your own. So don't, you know, you can choose your own college for a lot of reasons. If it doesn't have undergraduate business, don't let that stop you if it's your dream school. Uh, but do find ways to, to get that education elsewhere. I mean, Tuck uh, at Dartmouth has a great summer program that people can do in undergrad that's three months. Vanderbilt has a summer program. Um, that kind of stuff is available to you. So don't, don't let it like limit your college choice, but also know that you can hustle around and supplement your education pretty easily. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Um, you gave us so much context for what we're seeing and living through right now. Um, your research really could not be more relevant. Um, you've really set the bar high for our future programs, and we will be sure to share your reading list of recommendations. Thank you, Professor Gold Goldsmith, for sharing your Saturday afternoon with us, and thank you for everyone who came to be a part of our first event. I hope everyone has a great rest of their weekend. Thank you for coming. Have a good day, guys. Bye. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you, guys. Thank you.